The military was never really a thing. I, I, I got probably about the time that I was 12, 13, started reading, you know, Rangers in Vietnam books and some SOG stuff and things, things like that. And it was a brief interest. It wasn't something that I was, you know, oh man, I'm going to do this. And that's, that's all I've ever wanted to be. Um, December of 89 was really kind of when it all came to a head. And there were, there were three things that happened. Um, the first thing was the Rangers jumped into Panama and was over at a bandmate's house and we were writing music and screwing around. And I think CNN was a thing or it was just, you know, cable news was just becoming a thing. But there was a little bit of footage from what was going on in Panama. And I remember thinking like, oh, man, America sent airborne Rangers to such and such. Like, holy crap. This is like, you know, we're not we're not screwing around. Yeah. Uh, and so that kind of piqued my interest. That was one of the things. Uh, the second thing was the band that I was in just kind of dissolved and fell apart. And, you know, it, it takes a lot of time to put together a group of people that are like-minded, that all have the same kind of shared goals and, you know, style of music, mm -hmm. uh, especially like singers, a really tough thing to find. And if you have music that's already out, like you're kind of stuck with what you got. Like you're going to have to find a guy that can sing like your old singer, you know, or mm -hmm. really tough. It's singers always the hardest thing to find. So that kind of fell apart. And the, the third thing was a buddy of mine had joined the air force and I had nobody in my family was in the military. So it's not like I had any sort of knowledge or inside track on anything. Um, a buddy of mine had joined the air force and he was home for Christmas Exodus and had just finished AIT. And he said, yeah, there were these guys that came around and recruited at the end of basic training for like some special unit that jumps in behind enemy lines and rescues down pilots. And so all of a sudden it was like, Ooh, that kind of sounds cool. Yeah. yeah. So those three things happened within a, probably within a month or two, I was talking with the air force recruiter. And that's that's kind of where it started. Did you find it hard to find information out about the military, about what you were wanting to do or what options were out there in that time frame? You said you read some books about Rangers in Vietnam. Where Was it the old LERP books? Yeah, there were probably some LERP books. I think one was like, you know, Special Forces. And they were operating out of these base camps. There was another one that I read that was a CIA operative that was over there, you know, working behind the scenes to make stuff happen. All of it, I think, was fiction. I don't think I was reading any true, you know, true story at that mm. time. And uh, anyway, so it was just kind of an interest. And when those three things happened, then I went to go see the recruiter. Um, I wanted one of the things that I didn't really understand was, you know, there were contracts and there were not contracts. And depending on MOSs, and I didn't even really understand what an MOS was. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, there's like no place that you could look up photos of things or to see what, you know, they're, go to the library and maybe uh, encyclopedias or something like that. But um, yeah, it's zero information. So I go to the Air Force recruiter and he's like, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I heard about this unit that does this mission, you know, rescuing down pilots. And that's what I want to do. And he was like, OK, well you have to take the ASVAB and we'll see if you qualify, blah, 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 blah. And the guy totally lied to me. He's like, we'll get you a contract. Okay, cool. So I take the ASVAB, I qualify for everything that I need to qualify for. And I'm like, now what about the contract? Well, we don't really you know, offer the contract. And I was like, I understand that you can't guarantee me the right to serve in this unit because mm -hmm. like you've got to go through, I imagine there's like some sort of, you know, selection process or something, but I just want to be guaranteed the right to try. Like, I don't know how this works. I'm in basic training and they go, oh, hey, Thomas, we need a guy in Louisiana to go flip burgers. You're going. Like, I don't know how it works, but I didn't want that to happen. So he and I go back and forth. He, he basically lies and says, if you sign on the dotted line, I'll get you a contract and make sure that, you know, you're guaranteed this. So I enlist, I sign. And I'm leaving one day after, you know, going back and trying to get something out of him for a couple of weeks. And 
the army recruiter standing there in the hallway and he goes, hey, man, what the fuck are you doing? And I was like, what? And he goes, what's going on over there? Like, you're here every week. What's going on? And I said, well, he won't give me a contract. And, you know, all I'm trying to do is, you know, get a, get a contract from him. And he's telling me that he, he's going to do it. And he's like, no, no, no. What do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. Delta Force. And he's like, <laughs> he laughs and he goes, well, you can't do that. You got to do something before that, like special forces. And I go, OK, I'll do that. And he goes, well, you can't do that either. You got to do something before that, like a ranger. And I said, OK, I'll do that. And he goes, I can get you a contract for that today. And that's how that journey kind of began. Um, the, the longer story, and I could tell it very quickly, he was like, hey, can't say anything to anybody about this, especially don't tell the Air Force guy that I'll drive you down to Andrews Air Force Base. You have to have this full bird colonel sign off on your paperwork to get you out of your enlistment in the Air Force. And I was like, okay, cool. So he drives me down there and... I finally get into this guy's office and I'm like some long haired, you know, dope smoking. And he fucking, he's screaming and yelling at me, you know, this is the worst mistake you're ever going to, you know, you may, you're, you're ever going to do like the air force is so much better than all of the other services, blah, 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 blah. Was this blah. an air force colonel? Yeah. Okay. Do it there. Just like sign my paperwork so I can get out of here. Yeah. And um, anyway, so that was, that was kind of where that came from. Went back to the army guy, gave me a contract the next day. When the, when the recruiter told me, you know, we've got this ranger thing uh, for you. Sure. He put a, not even a DVD. This is like VHS tape. Hell yeah. In, in a v, VCR. And, uh, and it was like a video of ranger school. It wasn't even, you know, ranger regiment it had nothing to do with anything. Mm -hmm. and, I think it was just about that time where, you know, special operations was starting to recognize that it needed to have some sort of recruiting and ability to show kids, you know, hey, you can come and do this thing. And uh, so interestingly, I got there in April of 91. So went through basic AIT, airborne school, the Ranger indoctrination program. And then by April of 91, got assigned to a B company through Ranger Battalion. And the fall of 91, I was in ranger school, but our company shot a video for the Discovery Channel mm. called Rangers in Action. And, you know, that was really kind of the first foray into, you know, showing behind the scenes, like, you, you weren't allowed to talk about the RSAV vehicle, you know, the Ranger Special Operations vehicle, and the fact that it had gun mounts on it and guns on it that had thermal night vision and, you know, like all this super secret stuff. And even though nobody was like making you sign an NDA, nobody really knew what was secret or what wasn't secret mm -hmm. or any of that stuff. But, you know, the fact that you jumped tailgate out of a certain type of aircraft was, you know, you can't talk about that. And, uh, and anyway, we ended up putting, you know, 90% of it on the discovery channel for, uh, for people to see, which, I think was kind of cool because it probably, um, you know, was an outlet for people that were interested to figure out, oh, that's something I want to do or, or no, I want to do something different. Yeah. So when you were, when you were there and you were going through your training, were you, was your initial training still going on when the Gulf War kicked off? Yeah. So this is, this is where it gets kind of interesting. Um, when I, I came in like November 13th of 90. And when I left for basic and AIT, it was basically like, hey, I'm going to be back in five weeks for Christmas vacation. Mm -hmm. You know, they had told me, hey, from the 17th or 18th of the December to like the 3rd of January, you're going to be back home. I got to basic and within a week or so, they canceled our Christmas exodus. And, you know, things were ramping up pretty, pretty, uh, pretty quickly for the whole invasion. And uh, at that time, it was still Desert Storm or Desert Shield. It mm -hmm. wasn't yet Desert Storm. So I had just started um, like our field problem in AIT when Desert Storm kicked off in February of 91. So 
in November, when they canceled our Christmas vacation, they literally got every basic training company that was on Sand Hill at Fort Benning, and they put us in this gigantic formation, and some colonel came out and said, men, needs of the Army have changed. You're all going to be mechanized. You know, you think that you're going to, you know, go to airborne school and do all that. No, nope, ain't going to happen. You're going to be riding in the back of a Bradley fighting vehicle over in Iraq in a matter of months, you know, so prepare for war and blah, 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 blah. And I was kind of like, oh, man, this is shitty. Like, that's not what I signed up to do. And I figured if we're going to have sustained war, like, I'm going to be at the Rangers and I'm going to go there and who knows what. Anyway, um, it took a couple of days, but our drill sergeants came and pulled all of the guys. Um, I was one of them that had a ranger contract and they pulled us aside there were 12 of us in the company and he said they can't mess with you guys you guys are you know this contract you're locked in you're going to go to airborne school you're going to stay 11 bravo everybody else is going to be reassigned to either 11 hotel which was a tow gunner on a humvee you're either going to be 11 hotel or 11 mike and you're going to be you know riding in the back of a bradley fighting vehicle and, and that's exactly what happened. Everybody got switched, and um, me and the Ranger guys and other people, maybe that had airborne contracts, but there were guys when I got to basic that had come in and had like, you know, $15,000 bonuses and stuff like that. And I'm thinking, my recruiter screwed me. I could have come in unassigned airborne, gotten a bonus, and then at the end of airborne school, I could have just volunteered for Ranger indoctrination program. And I would have gotten the bonus, and I still would have gotten to go to, to the Ranger Regiment. But it didn't work out that way because of exactly what had happened. That's wild. Were you bummed out when the war, like, ended? Were you like, oh, we missed it? You know, like, dang. No, I think, you know, interestingly, my son just finished basic and airborne, or basic and AIT and all of that. And it was, it's kind of cool to hear, you know, 33 years later or whatever, you know, he's telling me stories about when he got the chance to use the phone, he would call and he'd be like, what's going on in Ukraine? I heard we're going there, <laughs> you know? And so the drills are very much like, Hey, you need to take this seriously because you guys are going to go fight. And this just happened in Somalia and this just happened in uh, Russia. China is going to invade Taiwan. And like, they're telling them all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was kind of interesting because I don't think any of us felt like, oh man, we're going to go fight in a war. Like that era, there just weren't any wars. You yeah. know, we had, we had Grenada in 83, we had Panama in 89 and, you know, here it is 91 and this thing was over in a matter of days. And, uh, you know, so I don't think we were bummed out so much as like, okay, when's the next, when's the next thing going to happen? What was kind of the vibe of the military at the time when you came in? Well, I think to answer one of the things you just said is like, that's one of the things that social media has caused also is all these glamorous shots of combat and the gear and guy overseas doing whatever it is that he's doing. Mm -hmm. and the reality is, is like being in the military is about service, whether, whether it's serving during wartime or whether it's saying, hey, I'm willing to be prepared to go anywhere that you could send me in defense of the nation. That's what it's really about. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I say this on almost every podcast that I've done and any media that I do. I know far more people that died in training than died in combat. And I mean, not even close. Wow. Like, really? Oh yeah. Um, that's the way that it was. And it's a very dangerous business. So, you know, you could die in a parachute accident as easily as you could die from a gunshot wound, you know, in combat. Does mm -hmm. that make, does that make this guy's service any less, you know, does that make somebody's sacrifice any less? They were willing to give their life in defense of the nation and, you know, to be prepared to go do this thing. So I, I get it. Um, at the same time, you know, for, for my whole era of guy, you know, all my peers and everything else, uh, most of the people that came in, the Rangers, when I did, were in to do four years and get out, you know, either get their college paid for or, you know, they were going to go back home and be a game warden. And 
you know, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there weren't a ton of career people, but once you get there, you kind of realize, oh, there are these little things that pop up mm-hmm. and maybe we'll be the company or the battalion that gets picked, or maybe it'll be the whole Ranger regiment that goes, you know, uh, like, like in, uh, Panama and in Grenada. And so you're kind of, everything that you're doing is in preparation of that moment where they break the glass and they say, we need to send somebody in to do X, you know, um, you're, you're ready to do it. And, you know, interestingly too, I have this conversation and it's not an answer to your question necessarily, but I have this conversation a lot with current guys, senior guys that I know, um, people of my era that, you know, served in peacetime and wartime military and got to see kind of the best of both worlds. And the question is, was it, was it harder back then than it is now? And harder, by the way, doesn't equate to better. It mm-hmm. just saying it harder. And I always say the same thing. And that is, we didn't know what we were doing back then. In 1991, there was no PT program that got guys into shape. You know, it was the only way to kind of see if a dude was, you know, mentally tough enough to go into battle or whatever was just to abuse people, you know, hazing and, you know, running them to death in the morning. And if they fell out of the run in the morning, we're going to run you again in the afternoon. And, you know, it was physically demanding. Mm -hmm. And when I look at back at everything that I did in the military, whether it was Delta selection, whether, uh, you know, combat, whatever, the hardest time that I had was that first like year and a half in the, in the Ranger battalion and the stuff that we were doing to prepare, you know, for war, um, man, living in the swamps every week, doing all kinds of stuff, like barely eating. Um, it, it was rough. Uh, and, and like I said, harder doesn't mean better. It mm-hmm. was also, we weren't smart about things, you know, so we were walking around probably operating at 80% because we were so broken down all the time. Uh, you know, the logistics of things like a company to draw weapons was was hours long process, you know, go down to the arms room, stand in line by platoon, by squad, get screwed with the whole time you're standing in line, right? So hours worth of just, you know, people fucking with you and things like that to get up, you know, to copy your serial number down, sign your name. Oh, you signed in the wrong line. You got to do another one. Um, you know, just drawing weapons from the company arms room was an hours long process. And now that's, you know, boop, boop, you know. Yeah, here's my weapons card. Give me my gun. Yeah. You know, so it, it, it's just, it's one of those things where I feel like just to have survived back then was a very tough thing to do. And, uh, you know, especially considering there was no real payoff. I'm not like a person that believes, you know, standing in formation and looking sharp and all that stuff is something that makes, you know, I, I was never subscribed to that while I was in, let alone, you know, now looking back at it. The one thing I'll say is that all of that stuff, that super painful attention to detail stuff was it made us do everything to the best of our ability, whether it was putting together your dress uniform for the Ranger ball, whether it was, um, you know, shining the hallway and buffing the hallway as a private, whatever it was, we did it to the best of our ability. And if you didn't, you were going to pay for it. And, you know, I, I think that it was, it was conveyed to me back then as these little attention to detail things are going to be what keeps you alive in combat. Mm-hmm. I, I, I drew no parallel to that. Like you could tell me that all day long. I don't believe it. Like what's going to keep me alive in combat is either, you know, tactics and doing the right thing or, uh, you know, luck, not luck, whatever it might be, bad sure. luck. But, but the fact that I blacken the eyelets on my boots because they're silver isn't I don't feel like going to be the thing that keeps me alive in combat. If it had been portrayed as this is going to teach you to do everything that you're asked to do to the best of your ability, I, I can sign up for that. Like mm-hmm. that makes sense. But anyway, 
when I look at that stuff now, um, if I'm if I'm at the Rangers, you know, visiting or whatever it might be, and I see these guys walking around like, man, there's no military bearing about it at all. And, it, you know, I'm I don't want to be the old crusty guy that's like, they, they should be looking sharp. What the hell? Back you know, in my like, day. However, there is this one little thing in the Ranger Creed that says, you know, um, you know, your military appearance and, you know, she'll set the example for others to follow. And I look at that and I go, I don't, you know, at the same time, I understand when you're deploying for 20 years and you're not having formations and, hey, we're getting ready to roll out and I don't need to blouse my boots and all of that. I, I was the person that it took me eight years to get to a place where I could roll up my sleeves and unblouse my boots. Eight years. Mm hmm. And now we almost kind of give it away. And uh, you know, so I feel like that thing is lost, whatever that thing is. It's funny that that is like, that's like when you know you made it. You're like, oh, I can put my hands in my pockets and no one's going <laughs> to yell at me. It's like these stupid little things in the military. You're like, yeah. I'm going to go through all these crazy selection. I'm going to become the super badass <laughs> just so I can put my hands in my pockets and grow a beard. Yeah. <laughs> Or unbuttoned who cares you know i guess what i'm saying is like talking with people nowadays about was it harder back then harder doesn't mean better yeah. people they always think that harder means better and you know that's the kind of stuff you were dealing with so if if the duty day ended at we'll say 16 30 was our last formation in the rangers like when i got there we had, you know, three or four formations a day where they would assign everything because there was no computer to send emails. Yeah, there was you know, there was nothing like that. So, you know, at formation, you get assigned, hey, this is what we got going on or whatever. Um, the last formation of the day would be at like 430 in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And, and we generally end up sitting around waiting on the word until, you know, six o'clock, 630 at night. Oh, yeah. Then it was like a mad dash to get to Ranger Joe's to pick up your starches for the next day because you got your balls smoked off in your starches that day. They were soaking wet from sweat and your spits were ruined. So you know, when you, you say your is that a service uniform that you're talking about or is that yeah, camis? So we had we had two options. Like the dress uniform was never a thing except yeah. for Ranger Ball. We had what we called fluff and buff which was your field uniform, not pressed, you know, uh, just Kiwi boots, not shined or anything else. And then we had what we called starch and spits, and that was spit shine boots, starch uniform, beret. Mm, okay. And so if you were going out anywhere on post, there was no civilian clothes. It was starch and spits. And if you were in starch and spits, you got inspected by your team leader and or squad leader before you went out to make sure that you were squared away looking. I'm glad we don't do that anymore. Yeah, I know. Exactly. Right. So anyway, just, just to maintain the duty uniform was like a feat in itself. Mm -hmm. So you get done at the end of the day, you're sitting around waiting on the word, which was always, Hey, six o'clock first call six thirty PT. And then, you know, like, Oh, go figure. So, You'd run out to Ranger Joe's, you'd pick up your starch uniform, you'd get it back, you'd have, you know, hit the Burger King or whatever to get something to eat. And, uh, you know, make sure your spits were, were squared away for the next day's formation. Maybe have a beer or two mm -hmm. and watch a movie, go to bed and do it all over again. You know, that was kind of the typical duty day uh, in the field was something, you know, totally different. But, um, you know, the, the implied tasks right of just having a squared away uniform like it's it's super deep oh you just got promoted to pfc now you need to go get your rank sewn on and got to have that all taken care of you know it's just all of that jazz so mm -hmm. harder not better but you know just the amount of stuff and then on top of that oh we got to make sure the barracks is squared away your room is getting inspected like your barracks room is not separate from your work environment. Like I'm in a four man room, which was also our squad room. Mm. So all of the squad business is happening in my room all day long. 
other ranger privates are getting smoked in my room and leaving black scuff marks all over the floor. So that's got to get squared away at some point before, you know, it's just all of that. And uh, anyway, so when I look back at it, I don't think that's the way it should be. I think that's where the military is definitely headed in the next few years. Yeah. Like, you know, it's it's not going to be all about combat and beards and all that kind of jazz. Like, it's very much going to get back to, you know, the pomp and circumstance, like you mentioned.